look, there's no right way to grieve. There sure as hell is a wrong way to grieve. Mm. Yeah. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, of course, I immediately thought, well, yeah, there is. It's exactly how I started this sure. journey, yeah. you know? Sure. What is up, you guys? Welcome back to the number one mental health and addiction podcast, The Hopeaholics. I am your girl, Natalie Eva Marie, and these are my boys. I'm Chad. Hi, I'm Shane. Make sure you guys like, subscribe, and follow us on our socials and wherever you get your podcasts. Got a new episode dropping every Monday and Thursday. Please come check it out. This episode is brought to you by The Infinity Group. You guys, if you or a loved one is suffering, please call us today. The number is right here on the screen. We are here for you 24-7. Now, let's get into the episode. Mike, welcome to the Hopeaholics podcast. Yes, Mike. I'm so are. excited. I am What too. a treat. I Thank you for me as well. Yeah, I was telling the boys how, um, you know, I would say not necessarily met in person. Just I got to watch you from across the table. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then, of course, you know, we connected through social media. But shout out to uh, Staccato Ranch and Tulsi Gabbard yes. for um, hosting that Memorial Day event and yeah. then uh, me being able to actually meet you and then you now full circle are here that's so cool so it's cool yeah i was just at staccato on sunday oh my gosh and shout out to nate nate is amazing from staccato like yeah. that ranch is incredible yep it's a cool place they talked to me into getting a membership so oh yeah yeah it's like an hour and 20 minute drive for me but okay. i was like you know what it's only an hour and 20 minutes but it's an hour and 20 minutes but it's only an hour and 20 right. minutes it's such a cool place. It is. Yeah. It really is. It was. I was really taken back by. I mean, they did it right. On well, the plans they have for expansion. Oh wow. Oh my God, it's crazy. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Ooh. And if you turn that drive into something productive, somehow. Like an audio book. Something. Yeah. You somehow turn that hour. Oh, the hour twenty. Into a productive drive. Maybe a podcast. Something. Mm -hmm. Can you guys recommend a good podcast? <laughs> yeah. There's a lot. Yeah. Your episode. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah. It's all about making it productive. Yeah. That's, that's a good true. point. Yeah. That's a very good it's point. It's probably yeah. sometimes for people, it's their only little solitude of them by themselves. Well, I, I don't know about you guys, but like uh, how it's been for me in Texas is I get on the freeway and I'm doing like 95 <laughs> everywhere I go. Just Wow. And I'm usually in like just a rental car. Like I think my, my last one, I had a, a Cadillac, just a, like, 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 like a small Cadillac mm -hmm. with like a, a little six banger in it. Yeah. And <laughs> it's just flying. Yeah. And I'm not the only one. There are people oh, that no. drive slow in Texas, but there are pe the people that drive fast in Texas. Everybody they're is. whipping in and yeah. out of like, like California. Yeah that know how to drive. And some of these dudes are in like big old trucks going like, yeah. you know, a hundred. Yeah. Jonathan, I want to see somebody that have good old easy going Jonathan. He hates driving in Texas because everyone is a maniac and he likes to do everything. So he does not like a fast driver. I mean, no. and for, for, for some reason, your guys' freeways are like faster than ours. I mean, it might be because there's no traffic, but they're all like, um, concrete too so, w w and they yeah, just nice seem and not they seem like they just potholes. hum yeah you're humming on them yep yeah because they're built correctly california not so oh and then i trip out on the bridges because i'm like whoa those bridges don't look safe for california <laughs> 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 how they build the bridges in texas is so different have you been shane no you've is never it? been to texas well once passing through but not really mm. no mm. no hmm hmm we should fix that. Yeah, I actually, I actually like Texas. See, I'm there I'm more now because my son is a, is a, uh, Baylor, Baylor Bear, Baylor mm -hmm. Bear. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Congratulations, man. Yeah, it's yeah. a great school. Yeah, yeah. Super excited for that. Probably. Well, enough about me, man. Yes, we have a lot to unpack. But yes, we do. I don't know where to start. There's a lot. Well, let me ask you a question though. Are you for, are you are you a Texan? Uh, no, I cannot claim. To be a Texan, I was born and raised in Philadelphia. Okay. Mm. But I moved, my parents, I should say, moved us to Dallas when I was 17. Okay. Was halfway through my junior year of high school. And, uh, man, I've been in Texas, you know, more than half my life now. Mm. So lived in, so high school, went into the Navy, uh, went to college in New York, 
um, then lived in Philly for a little while. My wife and I got married there. Then we moved back to Dallas to be closer to our families. Lived in Dallas for a while, lived in Houston for a while, and then we've been in Austin like 17 or 18 years now. Is your wife from Philly or? She's born and raised in Dallas. Okay, so that's oh. where you met. Yes, we met, yeah. When I moved uh, to Dallas, I moved to a neighborhood very close to hers, and um, her and some of her girlfriends were out there on the drill team, mm. and they were out going through neighborhoods doing a fundraiser, selling stuff. They knocked on the door. I answered it. Oh my gosh. I was like, hey, how you doing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And that was it. How so, old? 17. Some, oh my gosh. Mm-hmm. Some, some East Coast swag. <laughs> Huh? Some East Coast swag yes. on her. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> no way. So from seventeen, you just knew, or it? Uh, no, we dated kind of on and off. Okay. Um, and then I I left for the Navy, and then I was back on leave. Um, like I don't know, a holiday or something like that. And we just randomly bumped into each other wow. at a pizza place, a grocery store, or something like that, and just kind of you know rekindled our our relationship mm-hmm. and. Serendipity. Yeah, we've been we've been married thirty years now. Wow! Yeah, congratulations. And then, and then together, uh, longer than that. Whatever the math is, I don't know. Wow. Yeah. You don't hear that as much anymore. I always say because my parents celebrated fifty years. They're going on fifty-two now, upcoming in June. That's awesome. But um, it's nice to hear. It happens. Yeah, it, it happens does. still. Yeah. yeah. My 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 son just celebrated four years with his uh with his girlfriend. They met in ninth grade. <laughs> oh man, that's <laughs> awesome. And they're both Baylor Bears. Yep. Baylor that, Bears. That, that's a good recipe to stay together if yeah. they're both at the same college. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Or that's her. Where her they parents are part. high sc- high school <laughs> sweethearts, too. So, I don't know. We'll see. Right. See, it's not. You know, I I feel like those stories are. There's more of them out there. Mm-hmm. So do I. You just don't hear yeah. them as much. You know, mm-hmm. all you hear about is no. Nobody you know. wants to hear the good stuff. Yeah, they that's like, true. It's not salacious enough. Yeah, they want to hear the hear, hear the, the drama. The drama. Yeah. Oh, mm-hmm. wait till you go to college. You guys aren't gonna last. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's the story. That's the better story that people want to put out there. Mm-hmm. I tell people. I mean, so. When I enlisted in the Navy, um, I went to a school in Tennessee, and I was in Millington, Tennessee, and uh, Rochelle's a year younger than me, so she had just graduated high school, and um, she went to court reporting school in Dallas, and 52 weekends in a row, I would get done my schooling in Tennessee, I would get in my car and drive six and a half hours one way to Dallas, Texas, just so I could hang out with her. And then I would leave at like midnight on Sunday mm-hmm. to drive six and a half hours back to Tennessee so I could check in and get back to school 52 weekends in a row. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So I don't know, you know? That's that, a commitment right yeah, there. Yeah, that yeah. is. The start of a good commitment right there. For yeah. sure. Yeah, man. Yep. Let's put it out there. So you guys, you. you guys rekindled after you got back from the service no middle leave no away. while yeah while i was there oh my goodness yeah. okay. yes probably it might have even been like right after i got a boot camp okay uh, maybe it was that was when i came home i don't remember yeah and we just i mean literally randomly bumped into each other that is so wild yeah 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 it's good to think about that it's yeah. stuff i don't think about that often but mm-hmm. it is very serendipitous yeah have it's you guys good. seen the movie it's a good word yeah, I the mean, no, I haven't. I, I, really I have not seen the movie. It's a really good girl movie. It's cute. Yeah, it's it's a cute. Good, it's a girl movie. Yeah. I've yeah. probably fallen asleep to it a couple of times. Yeah. <laughs> Says the one that you are the one that always Anyways, is talking so yeah, about how you love romance <laughs> yeah, okay. movies. I did like it. I do like it. <laughs> yeah. Like it. Serendipity. There was two of them. Part one and part two, I believe. No. No? Then, I don't think right. so. All right. Fair enough. Sorry. That was the notebook. Oh, that's right. That was a good... I cried. <laughs> Anyways, forget about me. <laughs> How how long were you in the service? Four years. Mm. Yeah. So I uh, I <laughs> I I joined the Navy. So my parents moved me moved us from Philly, where I was born and raised, to Dallas mm-hmm. halfway through my junior year of high school. Right. Oh wow. So it's a bit of a culture yeah. shock. Um, and just to show them on how. Much I appreciated that. I went out and got a tattoo the first weekend that I was there, mm-hmm. right? <laughs> so there's that a that. boy? Yeah. Showed them, didn't I? 
Um, but I was not, you know, after, uh, after moving, I, I probably just was just, my head wasn't right. I was a little resentful and that sort of stuff. And I was heading in the wrong direction. And my parents said, all right, you need to figure out what you're going to do with your life when you graduate, if you graduate. Mm -hmm. And they did something really sage and they took me, um, to visit all of the federal service academies, mm -hmm. right? So we went to the Naval Academy and West Point and mm -hmm. um, Kings Point, the Coast Guard Academy, Air Force Academy. We did that one summer. And then, you know, I was in high school in the 80s. And so this this movie, you guys may have heard of it, called Top Gun came out. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. And my father was a pilot. And, uh, and I watched that movie like a hundred times, right? And I was like, you know what? I'll go to the Naval Academy and I want to fly fighter jets. That's what I want to do. Well, I graduated literally in the bottom 10% of my high school class. And if you know anything about the federal service academies, you know, mm -hmm. grades wise, they kind of only take like the top 1%. So I said, well, pff, no problem. I'm just going to enlist, work my ass off. Mm -hmm. I'll get into the academy. So I did, I applied to the Naval Academy, you know, first year, and I, I would have liked to have been in the office when they opened my application and looked at it, because I'm sure that everybody just fell on the floor laughing, right? <laughs> but um, the, one of the things that happened was they assigned an admissions officer, well, they called it an admissions officer, but he was actually a chief or a master chief, to kind of help guide me through the process. Mm -hmm. So he said, look, Mike, here's the deal. You got a lot of work to do. You know, but if you do it, maybe you'll get a shot. And so he gave me instructions, you know, take some college classes and do these things and keep your nose clean. And so I did all the things that he said. And, you know, even when I was on deployment, I was taking college classes. And, you know, <laughs> this is another one going back to, you know, the 52 weeks in a row visiting Rochelle. I would literally call him uh, every two weeks and I'd be like, hey, Master Chief, you know, took this test. This is great. I got, you know, on and, and I just did that. And I reapplied for year, second year, third year. And then fourth year, the age cap is 22. Oh, wow. So I was about to age out. Mm -hmm. And, um, what happened basically there was, there was some sort of a round table and he said, you know, sitting at the table with a bunch of other, all the other service academies, and he said, look, I got this kid. He's got a great military record. We don't have a place for him. You know, um, does anybody have a place? And so there was somebody from the U.S. Merchant Marine Academy that said, you know what? I can put him on our standby list. And if somebody turns down their appointment, you know, he can get in. So they told me that. I filled all the paperwork, applications, did everything. And then I was in Japan at the time, and I got called up to the CO's office. And he says, congratulations, Petty Officer McKim. Pack your bags. You know, you're getting discharged. You're going to the Merchant Marine Academy. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. So I pack my bags. I head to New York. And, you know, I check in there and get my head shaved and start getting yelled at all over again. <laughs> um, and then, uh, so, uh, you know, mission accomplished. Mm -hmm. I achieved that goal. Well... I was, even though I was 22, um, I was, I obviously wasn't ready and mm. was still undisciplined sure. and, um, I kind of pissed away that opportunity and failed out of, out of the school, um, and then had to figure out, you know, what am I going to do next? So, um, the silver lining in mm. all of that is my oldest son um, when he was a junior in high school in Austin at Lake Travis High School, he came home from a college fair and he said, you know what, dad, I think I want to apply to the Merchant Marine Academy. And I was like, well, all right, Connor, I can help you do that. And sure enough, man, uh, you know, we worked our ass off and he got in and he actually graduated, wow. uh, and he commissioned in the Marine Corps and became a pilot. And, uh, so all the things mm -hmm. that I was trying to do, yep all the dreams that I had and goals that I had and didn't accomplish, you know, he did, which was, was really cool to watch happen. Yeah. That's incredible. I mean, that just gave me the chills. Yeah. But it also happened because it was in a sense you're mentoring him because you had just kind of gone through that process beforehand. So, or you had kind of some tools that maybe could have helped 
you when you were trying maybe? Yeah, uh, for sure. I mean, look, uh, he did the work. Mm -hmm, of course. But um, it would have been much harder sure. for him without, you know, uh, a little experience and mm -hmm. guidance. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, I was able to help him for sure. And I was stoked to do it. Yeah. Right. That's our job, bro. That's parents, man. Yes. You know what I'm saying? It's, I agree. Make that life easier, whether it's this or whether it's a high school class. That's what that's sort of good. That's what a, a decent father's there for. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man, I could really relate to that because that's how like I I was not a good student in high school. I I was a knucklehead. I got addicted to drugs when I was 13 years old. And, um, you know, I had a chance to uh, do it all over again when I had a son, you know. Yeah. And, um, so far, I've guided him to, you know, graduating high school with a four point a 4.3 grade point average and freshman at Baylor now doing the things that I wanted to do that I, that I like that if I have any regrets, I have regrets, not, not focusing in high school. Cause I, I, I was plenty smart enough to, um, achieve the grades and, um, college would have been an amazing experience. <laughs> so to get to see him have that experience, I'm just like, it makes me proud dad. Like I, I literally wear my proud dad Baylor shirt yeah, because I'm proud that he's getting to experience yeah. stuff. And it's cool because he, you know, he, he, he went to school and neither one of his, my, myself or his mom are not, uh, college graduates. So he has this extra first time, um, even though his his grandparents are all like my dad's a PhD MD, so uh, <laughs> just that yeah. just his mom yeah. and his dad didn't go. It's you know it's funny I because um, I've thought a lot about this and especially you know since and I'm sure we'll talk about mm -hmm. this but we I lost my son yeah uh, November last year. Um, I look back at that that whole thing and. There was a time when I was like, man, you know, I regret mm -hmm. this or I regret mm -hmm. that or wish I would have. But I've kind of shifted my mind a little bit. And while I still consider that my biggest failure in life, I have no regrets. Because if I had if I had of gone along that path, mm -hmm. my life would be in a totally different place. And I probably wouldn't have my wife sure. and I probably and I wouldn't have had my two boys Right. And helping Connor achieve that goal was was really probably more rewarding than me achieving the goal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. So maybe, you know, maybe that was supposed to happen. I don't know. For sure. I think it's one of those things where anything that, you know, you give it a go and it doesn't pan out the way that you had hoped for. So essentially you fail. I think it's crucial in building character and mm -hmm. making you become the person that hopefully one day you you know can become to live to your fullest potential yeah but obviously at the time it seems quite devastating i've failed multiple times but um i think now that i'm older like you were saying you look back and um yeah. i wouldn't change a thing yeah well and i think it's well making peace with it too you know what I mean? Finding a way to make peace with it, turning Agreed. that negative or whatever you want to call it into something special. Yep. Yeah. You know, you got to make peace with it. Otherwise, you go to bed with it every night and it turns into a cancer and it just, it finishes you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's and, a and very no, good analogy. Yeah, cancer. No point, yeah, yep. man. There's no point in living like that. As, as difficult as it is, because little things still bother me. I stay up at night uh, dwelling on... I could have been a professional hockey player. On foolish stuff. <laughs> I could have done this. Like, you know, sometimes when I'm thinking. You can't eh. do the could have, could have, could have, I know, could have, would have, I know. you know. Yeah. Still. It's just that'll eat you alive. Uh, totally. Yeah. And then you have to spin it because a lot 100%. of the things where people stay stagnant is because they don't have the balls to yeah. go and try because they're scared to fail. Yep. Mm. Where that also is another thing where at least you gave it a go and you're not sitting here today saying, dang, I didn't even try. Right. You did. Yeah. And it just wasn't your time at that moment and you weren't ready yep. for whatever reason. And and that to me is a accomplishment because a lot of people don't have the grit and to the courage to go and try something because they don't want to get either no or 
cut from the team or lose what they think they have. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's important. Would uh, you give away everything that you have right now? No. Everything that no. you have right now? No. For the future that you've always wanted? I have the future I've always wanted. You mean like everything I have right now? Oh, you talking me? to him or talking to me? Sorry. <laughs> I, I, it was it was it was to everybody. <laughs> I'm happy. Wait, today, but I think, you know, it's no. Tough. Say that. Re, say that again, because the future that you've always wanted. What does that entail? Because aren't we you creating that daily? It it it. it so you are, unless you're holding on to those regrets. So when you give away when you, when you give away uh, the re the regrets because if you ha if you have zero regrets you're already living the you're you're already living the the life that you've always wanted right you're you're living your purpose your you know and I don't know what like your guys is is but when I put that to myself like I go back to being a kid I always wanted to be a rock star right well now I'm fifty I'm fifty years old. Ain't no chance that I'm going to be a rock star, you know, but I still have an opportunity to, you know, I like public speaking. It's become one of my, one of my passions, but I have the ability. That ain't that rock star life, brother. Uh, it, not, we're not, not a, well, what kind of rock star did you want to be? Well, back then it would have included drugs and alcohol, mm -hmm. but now I'd rather be, now I, to me now, spreading hope and love and passion and recovery that's a way better rock star yeah. life yeah than i could have ever have imagined my next door neighbor <clears throat> was a rock star he was a lead guitarist in a band um called blue october and um he's told me that you know it was a lot of fun mm -hmm. you know back in the day but you know, and there's a lot of drugs and alcohol sure. and he's clean and sober now. Um, and he's like, you know, this life is way, way better. Yeah. The life I'm living now is way better than the one sure. I was at the, at the peak of my rock star career. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You hear that a lot. Yeah. I think the other thing is, so the, you know, when you say the life you always wanted, I think like when I think about, for me, I used to be a goal, a, like mm. a goal oriented person. I, just, I was just a big dreamer and I would set goals and all I wanted to do was accomplish the goal mm -hmm. and then set the next goal. Mm. Right. And that's yeah. so the life I didn't know. Mm. I had no idea. The life that I want at one moment is just to achieve this one mm -hmm. goal. But then once I achieve it, if I don't have another goal, Depression sets in. Yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. bro. I've been, I've been there. Yes. I've been there. Just yeah. One to the next, never never taking time to dwell on the good and say, wow, that was, you know, let's enjoy this for a minute. Yeah. Yeah, man. Yeah. yeah. It's a slippery slope yeah. because you can't sit and. No, you can't sit that clap. long in it. No, yeah. you can't. So that's also yeah, bad, too. It's, it's, a, it's, yeah. a, it's, a, it's a balance. Yeah. But I agree. I mean, I think also, too different stages of our lives, you know, you think that you want something for your future or for your life to be something and then you you go through things, you well, experience. That's, that's the thing, you asked this question 10 years ago, my answer is one way, you asked it in 10 years from now, it's right. different. I get a divorce, all of a sudden I'm in a bad mood, I wanna, I'll have a different answer for you. So so when I say that you give away everything that you that you have, I'm not saying that the people in your life are gone, it's just that, the relationships with them might, might be, be better. Yeah, we you know, the, we don't know. Well, they they are if 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 oh, if, you, if, if you're looking at the life that right. you've always wanted. Unless you just want to get rid of everybody. Well, the, the, I mean that <laughs> that's a thing too. But yeah. the my my point is is that you know your your future uh, is it becomes more beautiful as you let go more of more and more of yeah. the past. Yeah. 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 And you build and you establish. It's. It, it, I mean, it probably sounds a little bit better in my head. Let's say we let go of the pain, not to. the past, because the past is, could be nostalgic, I mean, and that could pain be good. Is good. Yeah, it is. Pain is, pa really, is past really pain really good. good? Hmm? Is past pain good when you're dwelling on it and you're not sad? if you're dwelling on it? No, well, you got to make peace. You got to make peace with it, let it go. But if you if you remember nostalgically on the on the past, I think that's that's a good feeling. That's a nice heart thing for me. Anyways, it is. 
Nostalgia. You can't do it too. You can't live in the past and you can't live in the future. You have to stay in the present or else that's when the mind starts going yeah, to oh, cuckoo because right. you can't control. You can only control what, sure, what you have control over. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, I think every human really wants to just be at peace with themselves so that way they can enjoy whatever current state that they're at. Hence why people, you know, try to pick up and use a drug to yeah. change their state or mm. to not feel something or yeah. going through... Uh, some type of pain usually is <clears throat> is a <clears throat> is a reason. Uh, so I think learning yourself and learning how to manage all of life's trials and tribulations for you to just be okay. I think that's kind of that's the goal. Yeah, is to be okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Not always an easy goal. No, yeah. it's not, man. Mm-mm. It's not. It takes a lot of work for everybody. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Because I feel like anybody that would say that they wake up every single day like they're um, hit the chirping. ground running and yeah. chirping and everything is like hunky dory is a liar because that's just not real life. You know, things happen out of your control that um, is going to affect whether it's your family, your kids, parents, um, close friends, etc. Because life is uh, cold. It's a cold world. Well, we yeah. could statistically just prove it. Look, you got obesity rates 40. Uh, overweight is another 50%. So you're looking at 65, 70% of this, 40% divorce rate. So people are not, people need to do stuff to stay happy. Life is difficult mm-hmm. just by statistics. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, cancer's on the rise. Mental health is on the rise. You know, we got to start doing more and more and more on a daily basis. Yeah. Those things are all on a rise. Yeah. Uh, I'm I'm I no I I'm not, I was about to tell you why. Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't asking you a question like holy shit. Holy shit those things wow, are on yeah, the rise. Are, bro. Where you been? <laughs> <laughs> it's th- those things are on a rise because we are um feeding ourselves poison. Yes. In America 100%. for the last a long time. Yeah. It's been a long time yeah. we've been feeding poison. Yeah to the citizens uh but that's a whole different yeah that's a, that's a whole <laughs> but, other rabbit but, but hole i mean that, yeah but i mean you <laughs> so. can start there with what shane was talking about you can start there you know and that's that's a that's a, a solution to that problem um i kind of want to dive deeper and you, you you went to your son uh connor and um he passed away in november mm-hmm. of just last year mm-hmm. how are you doing <laughs> How are you getting mm-hmm. through this? I know that's a tough question, but um, I want to I want to dive in here, and then we'll go back a bit. Mm-hmm. You know, it, uh, I think to Natalie's point, um, <clears throat> I I think just growing up because of the family, I was in a great family, loving family, and and. Um, and my dad was an overachiever and just kind of maybe instilled that in me. Um, I've always, you know, dreamed big and set goals. And I was one of those people that probably 90, at least 90% of the time I would jump out of bed, ready to take on the world like that. Mm. I was just excited. And then like everybody, you know, I had my 10% where I'm off. I'm, you know, I'm not fired up. And uh, now I'm, I'm totally the opposite. I'm like sad 90% of the time. And, you know, and the other 10, you know, I'll, I'll get a, a little fire under me every once in a while, but it's tough. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Especially with, you know, you have y- your wife and your other son as well, so mm. managing that I couldn't even, I couldn't imagine um, what has to, what it takes on, not only you as an individual, but also um, for the rest of the family. Yeah. Yeah, it's not easy. Yeah, it was rough. Um, you know, right after, right after we lost Connor, my youngest son Cole and I, you know, immediately, <clears throat> we basically just started drinking. Mm-hmm. You know, and so we were fucked up all the time. And here my wife is trying to grieve, you know, for her son. Mm. 
and now she's got to worry about the two of us. Um, you know, and luckily, you know, luckily she was vocal about it. And, uh, you know, Cole and I sat down, I was like, dude, we gotta, we gotta take a break. So, you know, the good news is we did that and, and, uh, you know, it, it doesn't make everything perfect by any stretch, but, um, my youngest son Cole is 23. I mean, he's taken us hard. Connor was his mm -hmm. hero, right? You know, we looked up to him a lot. Um, and he struggled with substance abuse, uh, went to rehab for the first time when he was 18. Mm. Um, and then <clears throat> just, you know, he, he just went off the rails, you know, not too long ago. Um, and that was, you know, once again, that was tough. Um, I mean, cause he was really, really, really bad. And, uh, <laughs> I basically, I just kind of prepared myself that I was going to lose my other son, mm -hmm. uh, which was a really rough time. Um, so I kind of emotionally detached from the whole situation. Cause I was like, I just, I don't even know if I can handle this. Yeah you know, what's going to, what I know is going to happen or what I think is going to happen. Um, good news is, uh, we got him into rehab again. You know, we thought everything was okay. He got out, relapsed. Um, he's in a new facility now. We just saw him last Saturday for the first time in a little while. And, uh, man, he's doing so much better And the place he's at now. So the first two places he went, I think what I learned is they basically, they focused on treating the addiction mm -hmm. and not the cause of the addiction, mm -hmm. right? And he's, he experienced some trauma when he was 13. Um, and then, of course, the loss of his brother. Um, and so this place that he's at now, they really focus on the, the therapy side of it. And so he's doing equine therapy and he's getting lots of counseling and, and grief counseling. And it was, you know, I've been cautiously optimistic the whole time, right? Just once again, just kind of probably just putting armor on my emotions. Mm -hmm. Um, but man, when we talked to him last weekend, it was, I mean, he was like a totally different person wow. and, and genuinely seemed like a totally different person. I mean, yeah, it was great. He put some weight back on and he looked healthy again. And yeah, it was, uh, it was good. Um, but I mean, look, to answer your question, the original one, um, it's the hardest question for me to answer. You know, when I show up at the gym every morning, everybody's like, Hey, how you doing? I mean, sometimes I just don't even answer. Right. Because I don't want to say I'm having a shitty morning, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and not because uh, look, my friends are there and they sure. would support me and they'd, you know, they'd hug me and all that sort of stuff. But I just don't, I don't want to bring anybody else down when I'm feeling down, mm -hmm. you know, I get that. Yeah. I, I, I kind of, uh, when I'm having a rough time or just, you know, in general in life, it's like, I want to process that stuff myself before I even talk to somebody. Yeah. You know, I have people come up to me sometimes and you can, I, I, for whatever reason, my emotions, you, they, they just, they, they just trude out of me. Right. And, um, they'll be like, are you okay? You know? And like, I always, I always tell them, yeah, I am. Yeah. Because even when I'm not, um, because sometimes I'm not ready to talk about it. Yeah. You know, and I'll let them know when I'm ready to talk about it. Right. And that's okay too. You know, I'm really truly sorry for your loss, man. Mm -hmm. And um, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, yeah, it's, uh, you, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not even there. The, 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 the closest thing I have is the, the reason why this podcast exists is the loss of my son-in-law, you know, and, um, you know, I love that kid and, um, you know, still, still not a biological child. Yeah. It's, 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 it's not the same because I watch his dad. Mm -hmm. I see his dad. Yeah. His dad hasn't stopped drinking. It's been two years, mm. you know, 
I mean, his dad was an alcoholic before, but it's just sad. Yeah. I watched my daughter. It was the love of her life. The only love she ever knew except for her dad. You know, and I watch the pain that she's had to endure and walk through. Yeah. Like she's barely starting to have a glimmer of happiness. Yeah. And it's been over two years. Um, she found him, you know, dead from the fentanyl crisis. <sighs> That's brutal. That's why we exist. That's why this podcast exists. That's how I met mm -hmm. Natalie. You know, I, I, I don't, I don't think I would have ever met her, but, but to be honest with you, when I said what that question earlier, uh, I, I would give up everything that I have here right now to have that kid back. Yeah. That makes sense. Yeah. You know, um, but, you know, sometimes, and I said this the other day when I was speaking, is I couldn't, I, 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 I'm an addict, right? I'm a drug addict. And I'm like, sometimes I've asked God, I'm like, why did you take Justin and not me? <laughs> because, like, I'm a bigger, I'm a drug addict. Right. You know, and, um, and he answered me one day. And he told me that I knew that if I took that kid, it would start a spark inside of you that has no quit in it that you wouldn't stop yeah. until everybody knows about what is going on in this world. Yep. You know, and it's been like barely 18 months that we've been doing this. And like, I just can't believe some of the stuff that's happening. It's pretty amazing. Yeah. 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 You know, and sometimes when I like, cause like I do, I, my biggest fear in life is public speaking. <laughs> yeah. But I'm good at it. Um, and it, when I say it's my fear, it doesn't mean that I don't like it. I just always been afraid of it. I just want, you know, getting up there is, it's scary. It's terrifying. Mm -hmm. You know, it's terrifying. It is. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Putting yourself out there. Yeah. Yeah. Um, to be judged. Yeah. To be judged. But the beautiful thing is, as an outsider looking in on, on both of you guys, and my question to you is, I know that this was birthed off of a, a tragedy, and I know you recently started your podcast. Now, is that um, because, in a way, you want others to feel they aren't alone? And in, in, a, in a sense, it's kind of, you're continuing to honor your son as well, and... Regardless of what anyone says, sitting down and having conversations with individuals that go through pain and understand what that feels like is therapeutic. Yeah. And is really helpful in so many in so many ways for not only the individual, but also to whoever happens to tune in and listen on that given day. And for the person that you're um, having on. Because everybody experiences pain in, in a different way because we're human beings and we're all unique. And so we process things very differently. Yep. And um, there's no right or wrong way to kind of go through a tragedy. And I think that's important. And I was so, um, so pumped that you started that podcast not only for yourself, I was just like drawn to you the, the day that I met you because I could just, um, the just authenticity and just, it's important. It's important for people to, uh, see that and be able to have that open dialogue. Yeah. And is, um, I guess my question really is, is, is kind of how this podcast was birthed was through a loss of, uh, and, a, and a tragedy and is that what inspired you to create and start your own as well yeah so the um, really the genesis was um i love podcasts i pretty much listen to podcasts more than i listen to music right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and um so immediately you know i've never really experienced what i would consider you know life-changing grief before mm -hmm. 
So I got on the podcast, you know, world and I was like, okay, find me podcasts about grief. Totally. And I just started listening to podcast after podcast after podcast. And I just, and they were all, I mean, I'm sure they were all fine. And I'm sure there's a place for all the podcasts, but none of them were resonating with Mm. me because I was like, look, I want a podcast that tells me the playbook. What's my next step in this grief process? You know, well, obviously to your point, there is no playbook because it's different for everybody. So then I was like, well, I'm just going to start my own podcast and share my experiences, you know, the experiences that I wanted to hear, Mm. you know, that's what I wanted to put out there. So it started just, you know, me doing these little 10 or 15 minute rants, basically, and not really rants, but maybe one of them was a rant. Um, And then it kind of moved on to, well, you know what, there's, there are people who know a lot of different things about you know, loss and grief and tragedy and trauma and all that sort of stuff. And um, I want to bring people in to tell their stories, you know, and how they dealt with it. And, you know, lucky for me, I have a close friend named Tim Kennedy who has a pretty big following. Mm -hmm. And I was like, hey, he, you know, he, he was one of the first people he was like, dude, you know, after I lost Connor, he said, you need to come work out with me. Like you got to keep moving, you got to keep going forward because if your body's not strong, your Mm -hmm. mind is not, you'll never be able to have a strong mind. So true. Yeah. And, you know, it was funny. The first time we worked out, we went and had coffee and tacos afterwards. And uh, he kind of said the same thing. He was like, look, I'm watching you and, and you're doing this right. You know, I want you to know that because this is what I said to my family. We sat down, me and Rochelle and Cole. I said, look, there's no right or wrong way to grieve. That was my message to them. And then after sitting with Tim, he said, look, there's no right way to grieve. There sure as hell is a wrong way to grieve. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then of course I immediately thought, well, yeah, there is. It's exactly how I started this journey, you know, Sure. which I thought was a good message. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, yeah, it's just kind of grown, you know, just in in my world, I mean, and not even obviously there's there's probably an unlimited number of people in my veteran network, sure. veteran sure. community that I can bring on that's you know gone through some kind of shit, yeah, and come out the other side. Um, but I mean, I I have a, a a buddy who owns a kombucha company whose fourteen year old daughter committed suicide. Mm-hmm. You know, so he came on the podcast and we talked about that. Just uh, last week, one of the guys uh, went on a men's retreat, and it was it was like twenty gold star dads, mm. and we were in the Ozarks, and you know we had a what's at this place called um, um, uh, Operation Barbecue Relief, right? They called it Barbecue Camp, Camp OBR, and so we went there. And one of the dads, you know, it was a couple months later. He's like, "Hey, I'm visiting a friend up in Dallas, and I'm heading down to San Antonio. I thought I'd stop by." I was like, you want to come on the podcast? Mm-hmm. You know, and he lost his son about two years ago. Um, and, oh man, it was powerful, like sitting down and talking to him. And then that same day, one of my close friends, we used to live in the neighborhood together. He lost his 19-year-old son in a motorcycle accident about six months before we lost Connor. Oh. So he was the first like close friend that I had that lost a child. And... I mean, you know, I watched him and his wife just what they were going through and couldn't wrap my head around it. I mean, I could feel for them, you know, because our kids grew up together. They were in play group together and stuff. And uh, and then, yeah, to sit down and chat with him and, you know, to have him say, you're the only one of my friends that like truly understands what I'm going through, which is powerful. And then to answer, you know, the the rest of your question, like you were saying, I get messages from people that I have never met in my life Mm -hmm. that are like, man, this thing that was said on your podcast, like is exactly where I'm at right now. Thank you. And that's, I mean, obviously I would much rather have my son here with me, but if I'm going to honor him, uh, and, and take his life 
and use it to do something better. You know, I feel like this, this might be why, you know, this might be, you know, just like you were saying, this might be why he was taken away so that I can, you know, share some sort of message. It's hope. It's hope. It's, it's giving people hope. You are, you're, you're sharing a message because I look at you and I hear what your friend said to you, man, the, the, and you're moving your body and I look at you and you're fit, super fit, you know, you're fit, which is, 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 is I, I agree 110% <laughs> that, you know, you, you, you're, you're, you know, it's kind of like what David Goggins talks about all the time. He's like constantly out there running and doing his stuff because he's callousing his mind. He's not, has nothing really to do with his body. Right. Um, mind, body, soul. Yeah, we got to do that, man. And that, yeah. that, and if you can show other people, other families, mm -hmm. because just in the fentanyl crisis alone, we're losing 300 people every single day. How is Crazy. this the number one? the number one cause of death for people 18 to 45. Mm -hmm. How is fentanyl the number one cause of death for people 18 to 45? That's that's insane. It is insane. So, so for you to be able to say, and and, and I, I, I know your son didn't die from fentanyl, I just want to want people to be clear about that, but um, it, it doesn't matter how somebody dies, but the, the people, this is happening to people's lives are being ripped. Yeah. A life-changing, traumatic mm -hmm. event, life-altering. Yep. You go from, you know, happy days yeah. to flipping that. And I know so many people, you know, that, that they're the parents of, of people that watch our podcast who have lost their mm -hmm. children. And I knew them before they lost their children. Yeah. And, it, and it's flipped because of what I do for a living prior to podcasting is I, I've run drug and alcohol treatment centers my whole entire life. Right. And I want to go back to what you said about your other son. Uh, um, you're 110% right where he's at right now because uh, addiction or substance use disorder or whatever that they want to call it today mm -hmm. um, is merely a symptom of the underlying root cause. Yes. Yeah, totally. It's, it's not even, that, that's just, that's just what that's we, just it's, it's a poor, it's a yeah. poor coping mechanism to totally. deal with the pain that's going inside yep. on inside of us. Which piggybacking on what you were saying, and I really love that because it's super powerful. I think Tim had said it to you that there is a wrong way to grieve. Yeah, there is. And it is, I completely agree because what can happen is all of a sudden that tragedy turns into tenfold because of, you know, picking up drugs and alcohol, leaning on that crutch to essentially use that as a solution when we all know that is not the solution. It's like a lot of heavy unpacking emotional stuff that you got to work through yep. to get to that root cause of what's going on within yourself. So I think that's powerful for your um, people that tune in to listen, to hear that yeah, because I, I've seen it. Too many people will lean on and won't have like a substance abuse problem, but all of a sudden now a tragic tragedy within them, their family now has spilled and trickled into a generational tragedy right. because of poor decisions of, of picking up something that's, that seems good at the time right. or, or an easy way out when we all know that it's not because then all of a sudden now the marriage is broken and now divorce is happening. Yep. Now the kid, you know, things like that start to kind of trickle and happen. And ultimately it doesn't help anyone it's really interesting um i mean cause look here's the deal i i i'm a craft beer guy i love craft beer mm -hmm. and i love whiskey right and so it's easy and you know i'm not an abuser by any stretch but sure. but um you know if i'm having fun and i'm partying sometimes i'll drink a little too much sure. it's it's the exact same thing when you're sad mm. and you start drinking yeah like your mind, it, it can't tell whether you're you're partying and being happy or whether you're doing this because you're trying to numb it. Sure. It's yeah. the same feeling inside, and that's scary. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, and that's the it, it, you know it's become it is it is the norm in our society today to uh, numb away a tragic event. Yep. You know, it's it's actually 
becoming a societal norm mm-hmm. just to Any numb a little bit of yeah. pain that you're having yeah. or, or a little bit of comfortability. Yeah. Oh, we have a pill <laughs> um, mm-hmm. for that. Yeah. But it is societal norm and very accepted if a, a, a death happens to drink it away. Yeah. yeah. You know, and and that's that's not the solution i'm not a pro i i can't drink because i'm an i'm an alcoholic right i can't drink because i'm an addict but um people that you can become an alcoholic or an addict oh yeah just because of a traumatic event event such as sure. what happened to you because now you're drinking mm-hmm. for the same reason that i totally did meth you know um, to numb away the feeling so you can't eventually cross a line and then it and then it's chronic and progressive and it, there's no coming back after that except for recovery and sobriety right mm-hmm. um I, I my point my point is though is that if somebody like you comes out and says hey you know what i did this in the beginning it wasn't it wasn't really working um and now this is how i'm doing it like what you're doing and, and you're doing many things mm-hmm. uh, that your podcast being one of them, getting up and showing up even when you don't want to. Mm-hmm. Right. Those are the hard. That That's probably the hardest part, right? Getting, getting out up of out of bed. Oh, for sure. And for showing sure. up. Yeah. I don't look and I'm not I'm not trying to be dramatic here or anything, but I there, I don't want to. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't want to go to the gym in the morning. I don't want to wake up at 530. But this is where, you know, this is where discipline becomes really important. Yeah. And, you know, motivation, I think what I've learned is motivation is temporary. Oh, yeah. 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 Discipline sure. is the is really the only thing you can control. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And if, if I didn't, and look, there are days where I don't get up. Sure. Yeah. But You're there are human. more, most of the days I do. Um and if I if I didn't keep myself disciplined, then yeah, it would be, I'd be in a totally different path. Yeah. How are you with your wife? Like, how did that? Because I feel that is a, a heavy one for a relationship to handle and to walk through. Yeah. Um. And share what you're comfortable with, so I don't want to overstep by any means. Yeah. No. No. It's it's a it's a fair question. I think it's an important one. Um. Man, it's a, uh, um, you know, there's ups and downs, right? And I don't mean just like regular marriage ups and downs. I think that the dynamic has changed because, you know, everybody's only got so much emotional capacity or love to give, yeah. you know, and... I think, you know, we're, look, we're super supportive of each other and we ha- we have discussions about, sure. you know, we're going to have the same emotions, but we'll probably never have them at the same time. Yeah. You know, so we got to show each other grace and we mm-hmm. got to be patient. And, you know, we've had those discussions and, you know, so we we're we're our relationship is very healthy in that sense. But sometimes it's just. um It's just hard, you know, like we're not, we're not in sync because we're not in sync, Mm -hmm. you know, and we want to be, I mean, there's no doubt. And I I truly believe, you know, one day we'll, you know, we'll get back into Mm -hmm. sync. Um, but yeah, I mean, our, look, our lives are different and our relationship is different now. Mm -hmm. It just is. Um, on the flip side, you know, I mean, it's like we're not talking about divorce or anything like right, that. Right, right, right. Um, but on the flip side, you know, maybe maybe this challenge is going to make our relationship stronger than it was before. Oh, I, I believe that. Yeah. And, and, you know, sure. and, and you know what it is? When you have a loss, you're always looking for something to fill. Or yeah. To take that pain away or that grief away. And I think a lot of times people are looking outside. And it's nice that you guys are looking inside. You know, how, how, how's the relationship with God in that, in the family? Are you guys, is it praying? Is it, or is it a tough? Man, you know what? Rochelle is really, really good at that. Yeah. Um, 
you know, meditating and talking to Connor. And I mean, she has, we just went to a, um, um, there's a program called TAPS, Tragedy Assistance Program for Survivors, right? And it's for, you know, somebody who was serving on active duty that died. Mm -hmm. The TAPS program is there to support them, Mm -hmm. all branches. And they had a regional, that was the men's retreat I went on a few months ago, and they just had a regional meeting. They have multiple regional meetings and a big national one in D.C. Well, this regional one was in San Antonio, so we went. And it was a whole weekend. And, you know, they have seminars, and there's 800 people there, you know, and... uh, it's really powerful. Like I already went through this on a small scale where, you know, I got to our men's retreat and I walked in, you know, to the first building and they had a table and all 20 of our son's pictures, mm-hmm. you know, are, are, are sitting on this table and it's just like, you know, waterworks. Yeah. I forgot to tell Rochelle that, you know, that was probably going to be there. Of course it was way different when you walk in, there's 800 pictures, you know, along a wall. Um, but the 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 seminar one of the one of the um, uh, classes I guess you call it, it we sat in on uh, the the lady called them God winks mm-hmm. right and they were these little things that happen that you can't really explain you know yep and it's your loved one you know talking to you and and Rochelle has been there since like day one and every time something happens she writes it down in her notes mm-hmm. on her phone and i mean she's got you can just scroll yeah. i mean scroll 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 it's like you're looking at tiktok or something yeah um and i was you know i i didn't i never didn't believe any of that right i 100% and convinced you know that whatever she's experiencing is true and real but I, I just had such a hard time. Like, you know, I would sit down, I'd try to talk to Connor. And I just felt weird. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and then, you know, she meditates and then, you know, she prays and I'm just, I'm kind of getting there. Right. Um, but I'm just not quite there yet. And it's not that I don't want to be there. I just, um, I think I want to, and maybe this is wrong. I don't know. I I don't, I don't want to just do or say it to do or say it. Like I want to, I want to really feel it, Mm -hmm. you know, like it's the right next step. I don't know if that sounds. I don't think there's anything wrong. Yeah. Everyone's got their time, bro. Yeah. 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 And I feel like there's no right or wrong. It kind of reminds that me and that AA. stuff. There's no right or wrong. Yeah. <laughs> like, because people, you know, you, you, people all walks of life come into a 12 step program yeah. for substance abuse or um, addiction. And um, when it comes to like the praying and the meditating part, you know, a lot of people have a ill connotation with religion or uh, don't believe in God or, or whatever it may be, what, whatever the case is. Um, and there's no right or wrong way. Yeah. It's like you eventually, when it's time you to whatever relationship, however you want that to, um, blossom and become and we had a gentleman last night that just, it's who he can do business with you know well, his god is somebody that he created and um it's whatever is in your own mind yeah and how it works for you and it always happens in due time so it's like relieving the pressure off of yourself of because she, your wife does it one way doesn't mean that you have to follow that same exact way right like I know we have like our little morning routines that we do daily. Um, and I guarantee you his is going to be, they're similar, but like different. Right. You know? Um, and I think that's the beautiful thing yeah. about your relationship with a higher power. And obviously I think as long as you don't think that you're running the show, I know for sure I'm not <laughs> when I am, it's not good. Yeah. Um, that's all that really matters. Yeah. You know? And I think the God winks and what your wife is doing, I think that's nice because she's, you know, you're li- it's kind of a dream. With, that you're go- and you know what I'm saying? It's, it doesn't seem real. And God is like that. He's out there and it's, it's, it's a jump. Yeah. And uh, I lost my grandmother and uh, she always bothered me, be- not bothered me, she always um, yelled if I saw a penny on the floor, I wouldn't pick it up. She's oh, like, yeah. You know, what are you doing? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, so I pick up pennies now. 
I just do because of her. Right. And I was having, mm-hmm. having a bad week. And when I went to get the bowls for us yesterday, oh, yeah. there was a penny on the floor mm-hmm. at the um, thing. And it was right between my legs. I'm looking down. There's like four people in the building. I'm yeah. like, ah. Yeah. Yeah. That's one of the numbers. They one know the God pennies on the said. floor. Yeah. I don't want to pick it up. <laughs> this guy's picking up a penny. But I'm thinking my grandmother's like, she's on my back, bro. I got to pick the penny up. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I picked the penny up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's funny, though, you know. To your question, so I'm I'm not a non-believer or anything like that. Um, and what's weird is sometimes when a friend or you know somebody in my community reaches out and says, "Hey, this is going on. Please pray for me." Mm. I'll actually say a prayer for them. Oh, there you go. Yeah, yeah. But I don't ever say one for myself. Mm. Yeah. Why is that? I don't know. It's human nature. You know why? Look at the. You know how you can easily self-talk like. Oh, I'm a piece of shit. I'm not worth anything. I would never speak that to you. I would always encourage my friend or somebody that came to me. How we speak to ourselves is fascinating how the human brain works. Like I can cut myself down into shreds, but I would never do that to somebody that I love or um, is a family member or uh, um, someone that is, you know, that I care about. Yeah. Um, And that's the same thing with praying if someone comes to you of course like i'm I'm the same i will definitely be praying for somebody especially if they've asked and it's crazy how easily we are to (laughs) sell ourselves short yeah you know yeah good point Uh, i don't don't want to push i'm not a bible thumper but he's jewish by the by any means i don't you know what i'm saying yeah all i'm saying is it's nice yeah it is nice sure it's just nice yeah, no. A I'm, sense of peace. Once you get there, it'll be a sense of peace for you. Bro. I, You're probably right. Yeah. You're probably right. Yeah, I think it was our 10th wedding anniversary. My wife and I got baptized together. Mm. Mm. Um, and then, and this was crazy. We didn't even know this uh, until after we lost Connor, but somebody sent us a video while he was at the academy. Um, he got baptized. Wow. And they sent us a video of it. Yeah. Wow. And he never even told us, so he didn't know anything about it. Interesting. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, yeah. that is crazy. Yeah. Wow. Did you guys ever, um, did anybody suggest like counseling or grief counseling or anything like that um, initially for you guys to try to do? Or is that, I don't know. Yes. So that's a, that's what TAPS is. I mean, it, it's funny. The, the TAPS program... <laughs> It was, it was probably just a couple days after losing Connor. I get a phone call from this guy named Rich Cliff, mm. nice guy from um, Charlotte, Southern accent. Leaves me a voicemail, says, "This is who I am with Taps. This is who we are. You know, we heard about Connor. You know, want to give you a call, talk." And he called me like, and, and I just, I just like delete. Sure, you know. And he called me like five times and left me messages. I mean, literally five times. And I just kept deleting him, deleting, deleting him. And the sixth time he called, I was driving and I'm like, all right, I'm just going to answer this call and be done with this. And then I talked to him and he explains, you know, what TAPS is and what they do and um, the programs that are available, everything from, you know, group counseling to one-on-one grief counseling to, I mean, there's, there's just a an infinite number of programs out there. Mm-hmm. Um, they have psychedelic programs for people who experience mm-hmm. what they call mm-hmm. complicated grief. Sure. Um, and I'm so glad I took that phone call. Right. So I just started doing the zoom meetings in a, in a men's group and man, you know, I think no matter what community it is, once you get involved in a community, you know, where, you're people with people who are having similar yes. experiences, whatever that mm-hmm. is, you know, whether it's a fitness community mm-hmm. or you know, whatever. Um, it's a game changer. It's a total game changer. Yeah. So, so yeah, I, I actually, and that's one of the reasons I went on that men's retreat and I'm so glad I did. I came back and told Rochelle, it was like, I mean, everybody walked in there in different states of mind. Mm-hmm. I mean, there were, there was a couple of dudes that just walked in there pissed and sure. like, didn't even want to be there. One guy was like, my wife made me come. Yeah. That's the only reason I'm here. 
And by the time we were done that weekend, I mean, you know, everybody's hugging it out and crying together. And I mean, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a game changer. And then I've done some one-on-one grief counseling, but I'm just, I I didn't didn't get any benefit out of that. Right. Um, And not that there isn't benefit. It just, for me, there wasn't. Mm -hmm. Um, I kind of, I'm a community guy. I'm a, I'm a tribal guy. So, you know, I think I do better when I have a community around me. For sure. Yeah. I think well, it's funny you talk about it because we always discuss that when, when you're younger, it's the parent's job to build that community with family and protect their kids. You know, as the children get older, 18 and above, it's their job now by making friends to create their own community right. of like-minded individuals that are going to push them up. And that's yep. exactly what you're doing, bro. Yeah. It's perfect. Yeah. The, yes, the, I think the pushing up is the key, yeah. not, not dragging you down, yeah, man. lifting you yeah, up, lifting, well, lifting also, each other up. I also think it's really um, important, too, where you individuals, I think especially for men, um, because it's tough on you guys. It really is because you guys are the, the ones that always provide a solution to a problem and so we like to think so anyway <laughs> right. Yeah. right or at least you you'll you'll try to right. solve the woman let i know think so. <laughs> my husband always is like okay am i listening to this or are you are you wanting to talk to me to me to try to solve this or am i just listening to you right which now? is a very fair question very fair yeah. and i'm yes yeah because 90 percent of the time it's uh maybe even higher than that you're just wanting to vent talk be heard vent, be heard yeah i'm yeah. super communicative and, and i will immediately let him know because hey. he goes to to work immediately if it's like trying to solve something yeah. but we had a gentleman on a father um coop's dad and it was really eye-opening up for me he lost his son to the fentanyl crisis as well and um he had mentioned going through his uh he's he's very public and has a, a podcast and, and talks about it openly because he had experienced um not many men wanted to talk about the feeling of grief. Mm. And so a lot of men out there are suffering and feeling alone. And that's why I think it is so powerful for you to have your podcast because it's not only giving like tools in a, in a healthy manner to walk through the day to day, but also um, making others feel like they're a part of and there's hope. This yeah. Pri- yeah. Yeah. Totally. Exactly. Yeah. I mean, we have to break the stigma of that men are tough because like it, it's ridiculous. Like men men are tough, but like I think it's cool as fuck if a dude can cry. <laughs> you, you know what I mean? Like that's strong. Yeah. You're strong if you can show some emotion, if you can wa- walk through, uh, you know, really tough shit. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And um and be vulnerable to the world not like not like walk through it in public like stoic like it doesn't affect you right um because it does affect everybody mm-hmm. you know and if we don't recognize those feelings allow them to happen and work through them and work through them the only other thing we're doing is pushing it down. And when we're pushing it down, we're causing more pain, more yeah. trauma. Mm-hmm. And then, you know, whatever else can come from that psychosis spills, can well, come it from spills out to, it. It spills out. Yeah. It spills out in anger. It spills out. In, things. Yeah. So many things. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It doesn't go away. That's no, for sure. no, no. And if you can, yeah. so, so I'm, I'm of this and, and I have said this for probably 20 plus years because I learned it in therapy. I think the first time I went to treatment years and years and years ago in like the 1900s, my uh, kids call it. <laughs> Calm down. They do. Uh, it's, you know, it was like 97, but uh, still to them, that's, yeah. mm-hmm. they didn't, weren't even born yet. Um, but this therapist said to me way back then, she, she said to me that feelings are just feelings, Chad. They're not negative or positive she said the ones that you don't like those are uncomfortable Mm. because you haven't learned how to feel them so today like i can feel like i can feel your pain and and it brought up some of my own pain right Mm -hmm. um when you were talking but i'm comfortable feeling that today Mm -hmm. like i'm okay 
being sad because traumatic events have happened in my life that cause sadness. Yeah. It causes that emotion. So like, it's okay. I, I, and I, I want to tell you as a, as a guy who like, I, 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 I do okay with emotions today. It's okay that 90% of the time that you're sad right now. Right. You're supposed to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And thank God for the 10% where you catch some fire. And thank God for your discipline. Yes. And, <laughs> and that was and, built prior. And that's right. what I hope that you continue to show other men and, and women. Uh, uh, to show the world. Uh, uh, be vulnerable with that. Because that's that's the mission that you're on now. Yeah. And that's healing. When you and another guy sit down together mm -hmm. that is one of the most powerful messages that you can put across to anybody that's listening to your whoever is listening sure. to your podcast yeah I I, I I i i say this one thing all the time and i'll shut up after this is that there is one thing it doesn't matter in this world if I, you're an addict or not an addict um, there's one thing in this world that connects us all and that's pain. We all know what it feels like to hurt inside. Mm. Yep. And that hurt is how we how we um, connect with each other at the heart level. Right. You know, not at the conscious level, but at the unconscious level, because we know what that feels like. Yeah. And when we can get there, we can have conversations with people about anything. Right. You know? And that's a beautiful place to be able to, to, to connect. Yeah. We can change the world by connecting at that level. I agree with that. Yeah. Totally agree with that. Yeah. I think it's important. It's, um, <laughs> one of my buddies, he was like, Hey, I just want to, you know, I'm going to come over and let's go grab some lunch. I just want to drive you around. We'll hang out together. And I said, great. And, so as we're driving, you know, he's, his kids and our, our, my kids grew up together as well. Our kids grew up together. Um, and he started, you know, sharing this fond memory he had about Connor. Mm. Well, and of course, you know, immediately I'm, I just start crying and he's like, man, I'm so sorry. I'll, I'll, I'll never do that again. And I was like, dude, don't, please don't stop doing that. Mm. Like you, it's okay. I mean, I love the memory. I'm just not at the point now where I can, th when I think about the memories, everything that comes into my mind is what's not yeah. going to happen, that there are no more memories. Mm -hmm. I can't just reminisce about, you know, all the great memories I had without being sad. Right. I'll, I'll get there at some point for sure. Um, but, you know, it's just going to take some time. And to your point, getting that stuff out, totally. like helping me get that out is mm -hmm. what's going to help me get to that point. You know, I say sooner, but just get to that point at mm -hmm. some point. Right. For sure. You know, I don't know if there's ever a time where, y y you know, it, 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 it all s stuff, some stuff never, ever goes away. I can I've been telling a story about my car accident and the birth of my daughter for uh, uh, 20, almost 24 years now. Right. And when I hit that spot, mm -hmm. I could tell it to you right now, just sitting across from you and nothing. Right. I get up on on a stage and I start to tell it mm -hmm. and it all comes back because it's like the whole reason why I'm even standing up there on that right. stage and walking through my biggest fear in my life. Yeah. Is because God didn't take me on December 9th of 2000 because he left me here to be a father to that little girl who was born five days later on December 14th. Wow. And to help other people that suffer with the same thing that I suffer from. Yeah. Which is this thing in between my ears. Yep. And I say that because like some people think that, you know, I suffer from a, a addiction, right? Normal people would say, think that because I put drugs in my body, but I, I suffer from the same thing that normal people mm -hmm. suffer from. We all, this, this thing in between our ears tells us lies, crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think everybody can relate to the fact that our brain says, you're not good enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't deserve this. Sometimes it's lies and says, 
you deserve way more than that. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. That's a, that's for sure. Yeah. You know, and I think people can relate to that. I kind of wanted to uh, jump in and, and um, you said you like fly all over the yeah, I know. World. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Before we get something? into that, because I want to go into that too, for sure. We're going to get into the business part, but I do want to ask one more, one more little question. like tough yeah, question. Absolutely. Um, on the days that are the hardest, right? So use ninety percent right now because it is. I feel like it is so fresh. You've done so much in such a um, it being so soon. You know, a lot of people. Um, have to sit for a, quite some time before they actually are moving. But you do have a Tim Kennedy who is, I think, um, incredible to kind of give you, continue to get, give you the nudge. You know, actionable action is always the best solution. You can't just stay uh, stagnant. But is it solely because of the discipline that you had instilled early on that is regardless of how you feel you just this is what i'm doing i'm getting up i'm hitting the gym or is it what makes you get up and get out of bed um obviously the the foundation of discipline was there mm -hmm. oh i didn't have it while i was at the academy <laughs> <laughs> um but it's really i mean it's such an easy answer it's because that's what connor would want me to do right yeah. yeah. I mean, if if I sure. just, you know, if I just let myself go mm -hmm. and was like, you know, fuck everything, mm -hmm. uh, you know. Which I'm sure has entered your brain. <sighs> well, look, I had, yeah, I had some, I had some awful, awful thoughts probably the first week mm -hmm. for sure. Like, yeah. yeah, super not good thoughts. Mm -hmm. Um but yeah, I mean, it really is. I mean, like, I got to believe one day I'll see him again and I don't want him to say, Dad, why were you such a piece of shit? Mm -hmm. You know, I was dropping pennies to let you know <laughs> you should keep going. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, so it's, you know, obviously it's having some discipline instilled in me, you know, from an early age from my parents, in particular my dad. Um, it's having a community that pushes me mm -hmm. and that's encouraging. Um, you know, fortunately for me, I've got a handful of, of, you know, yeah. lunatic friends like yeah. Tim. Um, and then, yeah, it's just, you know, when I did Connor's eulogy, I stood up and I, I said, um, so I ended with these three questions. I said, you know, what would Connor expect you to do? Mm -hmm. And he would expect everybody to be sad and to cry. Uh, then what would he want you to do? And I said, he would want you to remember all the good times and, you know, um, go forward with your life. And, and then um, what would honor him? And that's different for everybody. Sure. But figure out what that is. And those are the three questions that I left everybody with. And I mean, you know, that what would honor him is definitely, it's a question that, you know, I ask myself regularly for sure. That's why I think you creating the podcast and being able to have the conversations in the open dialogue, not only is honoring his legacy to continue him to be right there with you as you're walking that path, but also you're saving a ton of people that are tuning in because a lot of people um, commit suicide because that they feel like they're either alone or that no one can understand how they feel. Yeah. And um, you're opening up that um, dark place because I can't speak on it because I don't have children. And then obviously I haven't lost one and I couldn't even imagine um, what that would feel like. And it's, I got to, um, meet Justin's father and then obviously experiencing it with with Chad but um on a personal level I, I can't speak on it and that's what why I think it's so beautiful you being able to have the courage and um vulnerability to give space to other individuals that have walked through something 
um, but also for that person that is just tuning in on a bad day yeah and needs to hear something um that oh they're doing x y and z yeah and they too will press on yeah i'm not the only one that feels this way or sure. i'm not the only one who's had this thought or i'm not yeah i mean it's there's power in that for sure yeah it's huge so i think that's amazing thank you okay and now the end, you got to make the decision to get up out of bed man yeah. You know what I mean? That's Absolutely. Just life. My grandmother went through, lost five family members in, in the World War. She was the only one who survived in bed for like a year. Doctor said, get out of bed. Just start moving. No secrets. Right. That's what you're doing. Yeah. You're not taking time. You're just moving. Yeah, man. Good for you. There's also the, thank you. There's also the flip side of that too. And I experienced this where sometimes you go into hyperdrive just to stay busy yeah. to keep your mind off yeah. of it. So yeah. he, he, uh, it's really important to be cognizant of that too. Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that yeah. was, that was kind of stage two for me was like, stay busy, blinders, nobody else mm -hmm. in the world. I just got to stay, bu I'm too busy for anybody or anything other yeah, than yeah. being busy. Which you're not even processing anything at that point. You're no. just like a robot. Yeah. Which obviously isn't healthy. And no. I think on any, on any element, like anything too much of any sorts, you know, you, you got to, be able to yeah, reel it back in. Yeah. yeah. But sometimes you got to go extreme for sure. to be able to reel yeah, it back. Yeah, I know. Into, it's wild. You know, Life yeah. is wild. Yeah. And that's what's so <laughs> nuts about it is that there is no like playbook. Right. Every person is different and every person is going to experience yep. um, how they walk through things differently and at different stages, different times. Um, and that's all okay. But obviously, I think everyone can agree there is a healthy way to go about certain things and then a destructive way. Sure. And we tried to not do too much destruction. <laughs> that's the plan. That's, yeah. That's a good, yeah. that's, that's a good part of the exactly. playbook. Yeah. Not cause any more wreckage. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But now we can go on to the travel work and entrepreneurship because yeah. it's been around. First of all, I love coffee and um, you're basically the one that coined the, cold brew or nitro cold blue brew isn't that right yes yep which is wild because that's insane <laughs> like yeah what what even sparked this what sparked the coffee yeah thing? you love coffee no coffee <laughs> i've totally backed into it i was uh <laughs> i was in the telecom business um in the late 90s in the 1900s yeah <laughs> and um my buddy and I, we worked for his dad. We were selling fiber optic cable and twisted pair copper cable and you know, that sort of stuff when, during the whole dot-com boom. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I like to think it's because we were really great salespeople, <laughs> but the reality was there was supply and demand. You know, there was low supply, high demand, so we were making really good money. <laughs> we went snow skiing with our wives, and both of us always just, you know, talked man, we just want to be our own boss. Sure. We want to be entrepreneurs and, you know, live in a mansion, drive a Lamborghini and, you know, all this sort of stuff, right? That was mm -hmm. the, that was the 20 ish year old dream. So we were in Tahoe and I said, man, I got an uncle has a business in Reno, you know, and drives a Ferrari and super cool guy and let's go visit him. So we went to visit him and he makes, uh, my uncle Carl makes uh, food analyzation equipment and he invented this machine uh, uh, called an Agtron, and it measures the degree of roast of coffee. So you take your coffee, you grind it, you put it in this machine, it assigns it a number, and that number is your level of darkness, lightness mm -hmm. of the coffee, right? So instead of saying light, medium, or dark, which means 10 different things to yeah, 10 totally. different people, you know, you put it in the machine, and Agtron 45 is an Agtron 45. No matter where you go, it's the international industry standard for roast classification, right? So we go and visit him, and coffee was just a, teeny part of his business he made uh, you know high fidelity uh, audio equipment and then these analyzers that he sold to mcdonald's for their french fries and oh tomatoes God. and um to planners for extruded snacks and peanuts and flour and you know all this sort of stuff he had a little coffee roaster set up in his warehouse and uh, he was showing us the agtron and he says have you guys ever seen coffee being roasted before or have you ever roasted coffee or whatever? And we were like, no. And he's like, come on, let's go roast a batch of coffee. And so we went and roasted a batch of coffee with him. And we looked at each other and, and I go, 
do you have any more coffee to be roasted today? He's like, yeah, there's like five more batches that need to be done. You know, if you follow these instructions, you, you can roast them if you want. So I go, hey, Patrick, you want to roast coffee instead of ski? <laughs> and he was like, yeah, let's do that. <laughs> and so we started roasted coffee that day instead of going snow skiing. And then we both just like fell in love with the craft mm -hmm. of roasting coffee. And so I asked Carl, I go, hey, man, you know, where do we get a coffee roaster so we can roast our own coffee? He said, well, I'm selling this one because I got to buy a bigger one. And <laughs> we buy this commercial coffee roaster that roasts like 25 pounds of coffee at a time and ship it to Dallas, mm. put it in his, my buddy's dad's warehouse, and we just start roasting coffee for ourselves. We're roasting 25 pounds of coffee at a oh. time. We can't drink that much coffee, so we start selling it to friends and family and stuff like that. Um, and <laughs> one of the funniest, I'm just going to show how dumb I am, but one of the funniest parts of the story, I still remember this. Um, you know, this is back when internet was dial up, right? Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah yep, 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 yep. Patrick goes, dude, you know what we need to do? We need to sell coffee on the internet. I go, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. Nobody is going to buy coffee on the internet, Patrick. What year do you think that was? 98. 98. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, 98, 99. Um, so anyway, I was like, we got to sell coffee to coffee shops, wholesale. That's what we need to do. Well, there weren't that many coffee shops in Texas at that time. And if there were, they were shitty coffee shops. They weren't you know, like the types of coffee shops we're used to now. And then, you know, 01, 2001 happened, the whole dot-com implosion. Um, his parents got divorced. That company got dissolved. Uh, we lost our jobs. I kind of hated the telecom industry anyway, and I was really into coffee. So I go, look, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep roasting coffee and selling it and all that sort of stuff. And Patrick goes, well, I'm going to keep food on the table for my family, <laughs> so I'm going to get another job in the telecom industry. So we parted ways, and he's still in the telecom industry. We still oh, get wow. together and talk. Yeah, um, And I just kept going, you know, roasting coffee. Oh. I always tell everybody... The first 11 years sucked. It was brutal. Like, um, it sounds so sexy to be a pioneer, mm -hmm. right? And to be first to market or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And we were the first specialty coffee roaster in Texas, right? Back in the late 90s. It just didn't exist. Everybody was a commercial coffee roaster. The one piece of advice my uncle gave me was whatever you do, Buy really high quality, specialty coffee. Pay a little bit more money for it and people will notice. I go, okay, Uncle Carl, I'll do that. So that's the way we built the business. I was, I would go and take coffee in to coffee shops or restaurants and we would taste their coffee and my coffee. And they'd be like, man, your coffee is way better. But it's 50 cents a pound cheaper, so I can't buy it. I mean, that, that's, that's where we were in the industry you know, back in the early 2000s. So, um, yeah, the first 11 years just sucked. And then, you know, luckily this, what they call the third wave of coffee started up in these coffee shops, mm -hmm. you know, more boutique coffee mm -hmm. shops, um, you know, that spawned from Starbucks, started popping up. So we were positioned, you know, we were in a good position to supply them. And that's really how we grew the business. Yeah. How, how much how much coffee do you roast a year now uh just a little less than a million pounds a little less than a million pounds of coffee yeah <laughs> just a little bit less how did you come up with the name you know um cuvee well when we first started we only did one thing we roasted a blend for espresso because we were you know we were total coffee nerds mm -hmm. and we thought espresso is the wave of the future even though nobody drank it <laughs> Um, <laughs> um, we called it espresso cuvee. So we, we, when we incorporated the company, we called it capital coffee and we had some sort of, you know, genius marketing plan surrounding capital coffee. And mm. it was like all the capitals of sure. the U S and, you know, we'll, we'll find, you know, the best coffee shop in each capital city or, you know, we, I don't know what it was, but it was dumb, whatever it was. And then when we parted ways, I changed the name of the company to cuvee, cuvee mm. coffee, but cuvee is a, it's a champagne making term. So um, champagne houses, there's always a spot in the vineyard where the grapes are superior, right? The microclimate's different, the terroir mm -hmm. is different, whatever. So the grapes, they, they pick the best grapes from the vineyard. They only use the juice from the first press. 
and that's what they label their cuvee. So anytime you see a bottle of champagne, it says cuvee on it. That's yeah. that champagne house's premium. That's champagne the good. Offering. That's the good Which stuff. Which is crazy. I never actually knew that. Yeah. And I'm probably drinking. And, now, and you didn't really care at the time, Mario. No, did I didn't. I, no, <laughs> I didn't. Just pass okay, me that you can bottle. Just pass anything. It don't matter. No label stuff. Give us anything. Totally. Two buck truck. Lord. Well, what, uh, what, what, what's, a, what's a really bad champagne? Is it like Two buck truck is a really bad one. It's called two really buck bad. truck. Or how about anything boxed? I've never said boxed uh, champagne. Boxed wine. Boxed, boxed wine, wine is horrible. Boxed yeah. With a plastic bottle inside the box. Oh, yeah. And you're right. Champagne, though. Two buck truck is wine. Um, that's crazy. Though. Yeah. How long? So you guys have been in business now for, uh, since 98. So 26. Damn. 26. Did you, did, do it's you incredible. sell coffee online now? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? Good question, Chad. Yeah. <laughs> I hope Patrick doesn't listen to this. Sorry, yes. Patrick. Yes. <laughs> we do. And it's actually, it's our most profitable revenue stream. Of and course it is because you're going right to the public. Yeah. Now. It's, yeah. it's yeah. my, it's, it's my yes. number one focus. Yeah. Going into 2025. Yeah. Yeah. You, yeah. yeah. To go more heavy online. Yeah. 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 Do you guys have a coffee shop in Austin? We do. As well? Yep. So we've got, I've got a facility where we do all the coffee roasting. Mm -hmm. uh, about two miles up the road, we have a facility where we do all the cold brew. Mm. And then we have a bar downtown in Austin. Yeah, that's amazing. Yeah, um, you're you and your wife work together. Yep, she's my CFO, co-founder and CFO. Wow, thank goodness. Yes, because I I uh, apparently have a um, disease that they call fiscal irresponsibility. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, I've been diagnosed with that. <laughs> so she takes care totally. of totally. <laughs> yeah, make sure everything stays afloat and yeah. stuff isn't burned to the ground. Yes. Yeah, me and you are the same. Yeah. My husband <laughs> makes sure that the wheels keep turning <laughs> and the things are are getting paid on time. Somebody's got to do Yeah, that. exactly. You know? My wife pays the bills for sure. Uh, I don't know that I'm fiscal res irresponsible, though. I think I'm pretty pretty good. I, 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 can, I can spend if I have it, but, you know, I can also not spend yeah i'm pretty good at that um when i don't have it the only thing i spend on is how is it how, that money better make me more money mm -hmm. <laughs> yes you know, return on investment is go, good. going going and buying a boat or a lamborghini when i'm uh you know money's tight yeah yeah Probably not the best idea no mm -mm. especially when even if like you go in and you're like okay well this boat is really nice and I get a good deal on it, but the interest rate is 9.9. .9. Oh, right. Nah. I think I'll, yeah, because then you end up paying for yeah. the boat yeah. three times. I mean, that's what like basically three like times. houses are too right now. Well, that and the, they'll rate. finance a boat for like 30 years. Yeah. Like a yeah. mortgage. This yeah, was, exactly. Yeah. This, was a, yeah. this was a 20 year, a 20 year uh, note. The payment's only 110 bucks a month. <laughs> <laughs> that's great. Yeah. There's, a, there's a thousand, but yeah. Um, you said you mentioned, and I Brilliant. think it's like super common and huge because entrepreneurs out there that totally feel the pain of, you said the first 11 years were, uh, sucked. Yeah. Um, is that because you were, uh, not even breaking even yet or why did it suck? So I had a full-time job. Um, and then I was doing this on the side. Um, full time job to pay the bills, and then this was like basically your hobby, your passion, and yes. eventually hoping that it will going to be full time and take off and hopefully pay for life. So the all right the 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 story after the whole dot com implosion happened, you know, um, I took over and I started roasting coffee, and I I told my wife I said I'm just going to build this business, so I'm going to do so. I'm out pounding the pavement day after day trying to sell coffee, mm -hmm. and literally did not sell one pound of coffee in 10 months <laughs> not one wow yeah um so we 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 had right before i got laid off from my job i got transferred to houston so we had a new house in houston connor was just born i don't have any income mm. um and she's staying at home and i remember it was month 10. She said, hey, when I put Connor to bed tonight, we need to sit down and talk. I go, okay. 
we sit down at the kitchen table and she looks me right in the eye and she says, we have enough money to pay bills one more month. And then we're broke. And I'm like, okay, baby mortgage. This is not a good plan. Anyway, I go out the next day, you know, being my happy sales guy, ready to take on the world. And I bump into a guy at a coffee shop and I go, hey, dude, who you guys buy coffee from? And he goes, we're a franchise, bro. We buy from our franchise, you know, the franchise company. Mm -hmm. Shit. I'm walking out. He goes, hey, can you call me? Here's my home number. Give me a call tonight. I have a question for you. I go, okay. So I call him. He says, hey, I couldn't talk at work because I'm leaving there. I'm open to my own coffee shop downtown. And I'm thinking, sweet, first wholesale customer. And he goes, uh, I want the same espresso machine that they have. Can you get it for me? I go, of course I can get it for you. I hang up the phone. I'm like, holy shit, how am I going to get this espresso machine for this guy? <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, my uncle had introduced me to a bunch of coffee people. One of them was the guy who was the president of the espresso machine mm. company, La Marzocco. So I called Joe. I say, hey, Joe, this is Mike, you know, Carl's nephew. He's like, yeah, yeah I remember you. Uh, we'll sell you an espresso machine, no sweat. But do me a favor. Don't call me anymore. We're hiring a regional manager. She's based in Atlanta. And, you know, I'll get you her contact info. I go, have you hired her yet? He goes, no, why? I said, I'll take the job. He said, what do you mean? I said, Joe, I haven't a paycheck in 10 months. I don't care what it pays. I'll take the job. He was like, uh, okay, thanks, Mike. Click. <laughs> so then for the next 14 business days at 8 a.m. Seattle time, I called him every morning. I said, hey, Joe, this is Mike. I'm ready to start selling espresso machines for you. <laughs> and on day 14, I guess that was the breaking point for him. They brought me up and interviewed me, and I got a job with them. And so for five years, from 2001 to 2006, I sold espresso machines for those guys. Uh, and Lar Marzocco is like the Ferrari of espresso machines, mm -hmm. right? So I call that my coffee MBA, the five years that I spent mm -hmm. with them. And the CEO of the company opened the first espresso cart in Seattle, wow. like, you know, way back in the well, 60s or something like that, whatever it was. They were real pioneers. So it was a, it was a great experience mm -hmm. for me. But the funny part was um, at my one year interview, uh, he goes, hey, man, do you remember that day you called me to buy an espresso machine? And I go, of course I remember that day. He said, I was literally at my desk typing up the offer letter to the girl that we in interviewed. And I decided to hold off sending it to her until she followed up with me. And then I was going to send it to her. And she never followed up with him after the interview. <laughs> Wow. So that was the only reason I got that job is because I called him every day for 14 days. You know what those are called? And she didn't follow up. You know what those are called? Uh-uh. Like his wife? Oh, he's got all these things that some people call coincidences. Oh, sure. I call those God instances. <laughs> sure. Uh, yeah. what, I realize, what I'm seeing is like foundation, discipline, laid. It's a theme. Like for yeah. sure. Yeah, and that's I, like who you are. Well, that's what, you well, do. what do they Show say? Up. What do they say? Luck is, luck is where hard work and opportunity meet. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. There's really no such thing as luck. Yeah. No. There's there's hard work, mm -hmm. and then there's opportunity. Yep. And then uh, and those are those the moment. Well, you definitely comes, have to seize the moment. Gotta, yeah. How many people don't seize the A moment? Ton. Yeah. Because they think that they either they're not deserving or uh, they're scared to fail or whatever. You're right. They don't. Yeah. where it's like opportunity only comes around ever so often so when it does when it comes knocking on your door you better bust that bitch open yeah i saw somebody it. not seize the moment yesterday or i saw it on instagram this morning i'm not gonna say who it was though i'll tell you guys off air oh my gosh you're <laughs> terrible <laughs> this is like, i'll yeah. just tell you who it was and then and, and that's it i'll just say eminem missed the mark yesterday <laughs> oh, what? <laughs> yeah, what? did Oh, no, know. no, we're not going to talk about it on the podcast. I have podcast. no idea. I'm, I'm miss, I need to go now. It's just it. disgusting and terrible. So I, did. <laughs> <laughs> I am no longer a fan. Oh, boy. I burned all the albums. <laughs> <laughs> my, my you, list oh, everything. gosh. Oh, yeah, Do not yeah. derail. He's dead for me. Don't derail. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm not going to go that far. <laughs> that's insane. So you worked there for five years. Yeah. Yep. Um, and then what made you leave after the fifth year? I got to the point where, you know, roasting coffee was on the weekends uh -huh. and then it was like a night weekend mm -hmm. and then it was like, man, I really got to deliver this coffee on Wednesday. And, and then I was feeling guilty, mm. you know, that 
you know, during quote unquote working yeah. hours, I was doing my own business thing. And, and then the, the real tipping point was basically every December I would go on a rant and I'd be like, I'd tell Rochelle, I'd be like, man, mm. I just want to quit my job and work for myself. And I'm tired of having a boss mm -hmm. and blah, 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 blah. Anyway, a couple years prior, she took over the books, which was good because sure. I basically wasn't paying any bills. Mm -hmm. So she basically started paying bills mm -hmm. after years of not paying them. Um, she took over the books and I'm going on my you know normal December rant. She goes, you know what? I think you should quit your job. And then I was like scared. I was like, what? My safety net? Mm -hmm. You can take it away? Mm -hmm. But I was committed. So yeah, I on December 31st of 2006, wow. I quit my job. And January 1st, I declared myself unemployable. Wow. Nice. Yeah. That's incredible. I never look back. No. Whoa. I love that. But um, shout out to your wife because she's a savage because yes. she's like, oh, okay, buddy. Yeah. Um, I'm calling your bluff. Yep. Go do it. <laughs> yeah. And I think that's great <laughs> yeah. because like, you know, uh, I always say it, these guys hear it all the time, but having a, a supportive spouse is huge. It's huge. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. everything. She, she's always been, you know, my biggest supporter mm -hmm. for sure. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. I'm super thankful for that. Yeah. That's awesome. That's incredible. Yeah. I can't wait. I'm going to, uh, get some coffee when I go, when Jonathan and I come to Austin. Absolutely. I love coffee. Yes. And it, I love espresso. So we're going to take care of you. Yeah. We actually, in our podcast studio, we have an espresso machine. Set oh, really? Up, so yeah. Usually my go-to is an Americano. Yep, you can do it. Boom. I'm there. Can Sold. you, can you, can you hook me up with one of those, uh, high no. end? Uh, he doesn't talk to them anymore. Cappuccino machine? No. no, the espresso machine. That's what I meant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Of course I can. <laughs> yeah. Instead of paying 7,500 bucks, I can get it for you for 5,500. Is that, is that a good price? It's a good price. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah man. Are so expensive. We actually need one right out there. We need a real one. Mm -hmm. Cause Peter, I, 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 I'm I sorry. I don't, know I don't I'm not going to talk. I don't like talking shit, but that stuff that Peter makes from the Nespresso machine oh, it's is, poison? is yeah. no good. No good. I do. See, he's laughing. He knows Nespresso machine is no good. Yeah, for sure. Because it's gonna, like, <laughs> yeah. I do. It's funny because like, um, I want a real one where you, you know, the whole deal. Yeah. Well, I, I and I froth the real milk yeah. in there. Uh, I don't know if I can handle like me actually doing the like milk and all that. It's so easy when you get is taught it? the right way to do it. It's so simple. Um, yeah, the Nespresso no good. Like. Well, we live in, in Texas, but I'm out here obviously now because everything has changed and um, I'm all about this whole kind of mission that we have out here. Yep. And that's why my my God is funny because now I'm back in Orange County because Jonathan and I used to live out here, <laughs> uh, literally like 20 minutes away from this office, wow. which I think is hilarious. But anyway, the point of my story is every morning I make um, French press. So I like grind my little beans and yeah. uh, I kind of laugh at myself because... I'm like, who am I making coffee for myself? And I'm doing the most over here with my little French press. It's, but it's, it's, it's one of those things. It, there's a ritual, mm -hmm. and everybody has their mm -hmm. own ritual mm -hmm. to making coffee. Yeah. And yeah, whether totally. it's, you know, whether it's frothing milk or sure. making a cappuccino or my French rituals press. Make me gain five pounds a week. <laughs> That's because you're adding so much sugar yeah. into your. Uh, a little bit of sugar, and then I'm using the real cream, the real whipped cream. I, 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 I love. Month, and I'm telling you, my sand handles. <laughs> Oh, no, no. I believe in that. Oh, I believe that happens for you. sure. Just by adding just that adding into your coffee. Yeah, sure. Some bitch. <gasps> I like it. I like it. Tastes so good I, I it really does. like it. It's a, like a, a nice treat. A, a vanilla latte. And have you guys ever had those um, those sugar cubes that are like, oh, the, the, like, like, the, like the old school? Yes. Like not, not the not like raw, raw sugar cubes. Mm -hmm. And you get to like they only yes. the only places I ever get that is Squares. at um, the Montage in Laguna yeah, Beach. The little, yeah, the little the like Squares. little. It's yeah. a, but they're not like perfectly round. They're mm -hmm. they're. It's like a cube. Yes, they are a cube. Yeah. yeah. And oh my god, it Suck makes on them? it makes the fucking vanilla yeah. latte really good. Yeah. Well, that's because it looks like a cube, but it's really like three teaspoons. Yeah, totally. <laughs> exactly. Tiny, tiny they like smash it all in there. <laughs> think you like are getting like the tiniest serving when actuality. Yeah. 
It's like it's like when you go to throw something in your trash can. You're like, man, this thing is over full, and then you push mm-hmm. it. Oh, oh, I wait, this way yeah, more exactly. In there. Still got a lot more room uh-huh. in there. Yeah, and then your wife complains anyway. Yeah, and then insert <laughs> trash compactor. Yeah. yeah, I do it all the time. I, I the other day I pushed mine down so far I couldn't get the bag out. Yeah, the time to, and I'm like, I, I was like, did you see, rip it? No, I just I, I finally got pissed and I took the whole thing. Oh, and yeah. I just dumped it into the trash yeah, can. There you go. <laughs> You showed it. <laughs> I, I won. <laughs> Problem solved. Yeah, exactly. Um, what's your go-to coffee? It depends on, uh, it really depends on which side of the house I'm working on. Well, I actually, I take that back. I, a- after, my gym is actually right next to my roastery, which is nice. Mm-hmm. Um, so I come, I go to the gym, then I go to the roastery, and I make myself a double espresso, like every Monday through Friday. Oh, wow, okay. Part. Yeah. And if I'm... Um, Working at the roastery that day, I'll usually drink another espresso or an Americano. Okay. Um, and then if I'm at the brewery, I'm drinking cold brew. Mm. Yeah. Do you add any special things to a cream milk for a treat ever? I do. Um, most of the time, I use oat milk. Okay. If I add something to mm-hmm. it. And not because... You know, I mean, I love cheese and I love dairy and stuff. So um, sometimes when I go to the bar, I'll have somebody make me. I'll be like, hey, you know, what do you feel like making? Of course, it's always some sort of drink with sweetener and totally and cream and all that stuff in it. No, I'll indulge in that. Yeah. But that's probably like once a month. Yeah. And then for anybody that's listening, if they can, they purchase how do you sell it? Do you sell it uh, beans? Yes. Whole beans? Yeah. Um, where did they go? Uh, CuveCoffee.com. C-U-V-E-E. Yeah. And you also have Instagram for the coffee as well? It's, everything's Cuvee Coffee. Yep. Easy breezy. Easy. So people can actually just, I mean, isn't it funny that now you are selling it online? It is kind of, <laughs> yeah. Right? It's ironic. Funny how things work out that way. Yeah. Um. And then for people to follow your podcast too. It's uh, the B Pause podcast. So B P O S. Um, and the, so, uh, you know, it's, I carry it with me. The, uh, so the genesis of that when, when, you know, we were collecting all Connor's stuff from his house, um, you know, I had this box and, you know, we're, we're putting everything in a box. And then one day I was going through the pictures on his phone and there was a picture from um, every officer, Marine Corps officer has to go through a school in Quantico called TBS, Mm -hmm. the basic school. So basically, no matter what you go to do in the Marine Corps, you're a rifleman first, Mm -hmm. right? So you got to go do all the shit. Yeah. Uh, Even though Connor was a pilot, he still had to go through all this sort of stuff. So anyway, I found this picture and this was on his plate carrier, right? And I showed it to Rochelle and she was like, oh, look at that. Be pause. She was like, Connor was the most positive person I knew. And I was like, well, that's actually his blood type, but you're right. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. okay. He really was. Cool. He was one of those guys that yeah, like, that's nice. He never, I mean, and I'm not just saying this. I mean, literally, he never said anything negative about anyone. He just didn't say anything. Yeah. Like if he didn't like somebody, he never said that guy's a dick. You know, he just didn't say anything. He just, yeah. So anyway, that's the genesis, the B-Pause podcast. Yeah. That's cool. Really cool. I love that. It's a nice, another little nod. Yes. Yeah. Of continuing. So everything uh, on, everything is B-Pause pod, B-P-O-S-P-O-D. So at B-Pause pod, B-Pause pod.com. And then you have your individual one too. I do. That's just Mike and Kim. That's not as exciting as yeah, it is. But <laughs> it's kind of like the, it's it kind of like, it's, it's kind of like the Shane Earn, uh, the Shane Earn, uh Instagram. <laughs> I liked it. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> I thought it was funny. Shane, 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 didn't, Shane didn't like that. <laughs> no, Shane got yeah, I didn't get it at first. I you didn't. I, I was talking. I was just talking. Still shit. don't get it though. Ta- was, talking shit. Yeah, I deal with this all day, every day. Sorry. I know. 
Exactly. <laughs> the banter. Exactly. The man banter. I mean, you know, the weird thing about us is like our podcast is people don't, I, you know, there's other podcasts out there where, you know, there's a team, right? But um, we, we're literally, literally like family because we actually, besides doing the podcast, we work together all mm -hmm. day long. Yeah. So we're together eight, nine hours a day. Mm hmm at least pretty much almost five days a week yeah. mm -hmm. and then sometimes on the weekends mm -hmm. and then at, occasionally we get asked to go places together yep and then we're flying together you really get to know people yeah man when you're a team of three you kind of have to yeah. yeah we call ourselves the three amigos yeah. she made it up <laughs> perfect yeah the three amigos mm -hmm. we're gonna wear the costumes and do a Remember. do a real and we're kind of embarrassing some of the stuff that she, they, these guys make us do. <laughs> I just go with it because they say it's cool or they say it's going to make people laugh. Uh, man. We did some funny thing today, though. Like, we're driving down the car, scary mask, and he's, like, scaring people. And, and not, the, um, I thought not, it was funny. It was terrible. Oh, and we did a really good one yesterday. She was in the bathroom, and we stood outside of the bathroom for, like, I don't know, four minutes. It was about four minutes. No, I don't want to put you completely on blast, you but could, you know, we're not sure. <laughs> people, we don't, we don't, we don't Anyways, we were out long. for a long time. We had yeah. the camera rolling. Long, long time. <laughs> he, was in, so annoying. he was in a mess. The reel's they, coming they out think today. That they can get me, but it's like, I've said this a million times. Oh, we got it's you. Of all boys. Oh, we got you. Like, video, shit we video. we have like, video have proof. No idea. Like, we have video like proof. Oh, yeah, I know. I know, I know, I know. That, you asked, you scared me. Yeah, <laughs> I meant, like, uh, that's, that's, that's you think that's that... It's one of the best scares I've ever yeah, seen in my life. I've never seen anybody just like... If if we would have got you before before you went in, you would have peed your pants. Yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, I started sweating. Yeah. Yeah, I brought back childhood memories. Thanks, guys. She was like... <laughs> like shaking and stuff. Yeah, <laughs> like, I mean, it's like great. That's awesome. Uh, Not about me. Not about me. It Terrible. Is. Um, Mike, you are the man. I'm really, really grateful that you are out. Came out here, talked to us, crazy, crazy kids. But I'm really like so grateful that I got the opportunity to meet you when I did at that memorial event at Staccato Ranch yeah. because of Tulsi, because of Nate. And that's why, um, you know, those are my little God winks. I agree, you know, and it's, <laughs> it's one of those things, you know, Tulsi just sent me a message and say, Hey, be here. Mm -hmm. And I was like, okay, that sounds cool. And then of course, you know, I see you and your husband mm -hmm. and you guys are really hard to miss <laughs> in a group of people like you're both so pretty <laughs> yeah jonathan is pretty he's pretty yeah yeah i mean that in a good way yeah no no i yeah. agree yeah and uh yeah and then of course the, you know the pink hair and everything sure. and and uh i just it was it, it was really cool uh, and you know it was days after that i was like who was that person and because i i saw mm -hmm. some pictures mm -hmm. and i think i saw a oh, picture yeah. of you in tulsi mm -hmm. and then i you know pulled you up on instagram i was like wow that's crazy and uh yeah and then after i started the podcast and i'd listened to your podcast and i was like you know what i'm just gonna reach out yeah i said you know i know that you're in texas i don't know where but if you're ever in austin I'd love to have oh, you on the podcast we're totally come i mean we're in salina which i think it's about a three and a half four hour drive to austin my wife's cousin was a teacher at salina high school shut up i live right by the high school that's so funny that is wild yeah she was the drama teacher oh my goodness mm -hmm. small world yep but yeah we plan on going to austin uh a lot more just because uh me and you are supposed to do it either whether it's the what do you call it schemish squeamish skirmish skirmish uh tactical games that tulsi's been trying to tell me you gotta you gotta participate at least in one yeah so their facility um is out there and then obviously staccato yep. now you so we'll definitely be down that way um very very soon awesome yeah i look forward to it me too well thank you so much mike yeah. this was a great yeah, bro. great podcast. no thank you guys mm -hmm. this is yeah. awesome it, yeah kidding me this is and great and thank you for your service as well as your sons as well yeah yeah he was uh it, this is the other crazy thing i probably said this at the event i don't know that day was kind of a blur um he was actually our fifth consecutive generation oh, so wow. yeah my 
My great grandfather was in the army in World War One. My grandfather was army World War Two in Korea. My dad was army in Vietnam. I was Navy in Desert Storm, and then you know Connor was a Marine. Wow! So he was our first Marine and also our first commissioned officer. All the rest of us were just enlisted. No way! Yeah. My dad Marine Vietnam, so it's kind of it's it's wild. I just have like a soft spot for our veterans and being in the WWE what is so fantastic besides all the other things is uh I was able to go to Afghanistan twice uh, to visit our troops and just kind of you know um give some type of huge. a morale boost or, yep. or or take their minds off of what actually is going on That's um, so important and it was also eye opening to see uh how they were living yeah. as well um and then obviously you know my dad being in, in Vietnam also, and then what really attracted me to partnering with this group right here is because when we initially came out, just for me to share my experience, because I came out with my sobriety on Total Divas, is uh, we went to this one facility of theirs, uh, one of the houses, and it was um, strictly for our veterans. Oh, man. And to me, I was like, it's everything that I wanted to be a part of because I've seen time and time again that our men and women that give us this opportunity that we're having today to sit and bullshit and talk about things um, is because of them yeah. that, you know, fight for our freedom to do what we're able to do Absolutely. at home. And then when they come back home, it's hard for them to uh, adjust back into civilian life because, you know, you're, you're picking up a drug or alcohol and all of a sudden it leads into uh, not very good behavior. Yeah. So the fact that um, they really have like, places houses dedicated just for our veterans it's was amazing. like okay jonathan this is like literally where we need to be that's really cool yeah so awesome i appreciate you yeah i appreciate you and i'll All see you it. back in uh texas yes absolutely <laughs>